Good evening, this is the Oscar expert here with Brother Bro. In honor of I'm Thinking of Anything, it's coming out very soon, we are doing a ranking of Charlie Kaufman's films. Charlie Kaufman is one of our favorite writer, director, filmmakers. He has a manageable enough filmography that I could watch all of his films in a week. You watched most of them. We'd already seen many. We both pretty much agreed on where we'd put his films, so we're not gonna do separate lists. It was pretty much the same. Oh, without further ado, let's start out. This this is the easy one, the easiest thing to rank here. His worst film is probably Human Nature. Not even probably. Not it's probably to me, but far, may, some people seem to think it's okay. It's we really far. didn't like know. Human Nature came out after being John Malkovich, and it came out in the same year as Adaptation and Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Weirdly enough, it's also directed by Michelle Gondry, who did one of Kaufman's best films. So it's not even like, oh, he just worked with a bad director. This was Michelle Gondry's first film, debut yeah. film. This is such a vast difference between this and Eternal Sunshine and just how skilled Michelle Gondry is as a director. But this is also sort of a different movie. He treated it very differently. It's just this screwball, like sl kind of slapsticky almost comedy. It's not funny. The characters just aren't real people. And it's like annoying. There's a lot of great performers in here. Patricia Arquette, Tim Robbins, and they're just meh in the movie. What made being John Malkovich brilliant? That movie was funny, but all the characters felt like they had these real desires. It didn't just look at their failures as jokes. It was like both funny and sad. If being John Malkovich were approached like a comedy, which it could have been, we might have gotten something like Human Nature, where the characters were treated like cartoonish, where we always look to Kaufman for insight on, on human nature. There's really none to be found in this film, except for like the, the tried old way of looking at, you know, human beings as just beneath our like socialization, we're just very primal and we wanna have sex with everything. I mean, that was pretty much like the thesis of the film and it wasn't deep at all. It was just like, maybe we are kind of apes at the end of the day. Yeah, you're yeah, not, you're not gonna get something deeper profound here like you might expect from Kaufman. It came across as not funny and just also the performances were really bad. The directing was stilted. Pretty much at every level of the movie was just kind of a failure. It was just kind of a little bit of a slog to get through, you know, yeah. you only watch it for the credit. Moving on from Kaufman's only bad film, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. This and Human Nature are both films that aren't really like considered the Kaufman films. We ignore them when we look at Charlie Kaufman's filmography. Yeah. The film is adapted from a cult memoir written by the game show host and producer Chuck Barris, who made the dating show and is notorious for having been the catalyst for like trash American TV. He also purports to have been a CIA hitman and killed like 30 people. So I guess it's like kind of trying to put those together and glean some sort of insight from them, like his depraved mind and then also how he influenced television. I don't um, know if the movie yeah. felt like it was drawing a clear connection with that. This one was directed by George Clooney. It has Sam Rockwell. All these movies have like amazing cast. This one seemed like a project that may have came Coffin's way because he's such a hot screenwriter after uh, being John Malkovich that they were like, oh, yeah. just write like this biopic for us. This is not a bad movie. It's mostly entertaining. But I actually think the cinematography was very good in this movie and that it really elevated the source material and it elevated what was happening in the characters' minds a lot of the time and it kept it interesting because the story itself wasn't that compelling. I felt pretty meh about this. I came away feeling that it was very like forgettable in a way. Like, I didn't connect deeply with the character. I didn't really know like ultimately what it was going for. I think there are some scenes where what it's like, going for like comes out like when they're driving away from the wedding and it's there were some moments that shine for me. It was also sort of a fun, trying to be a fun movie and Sam Rockwell plays the protagonist. He's very good in it. He's very entertaining. It was just sort of a meh to good biopic. And it's the least Kaufman-esque movie. Yeah, absolutely. This one, you, you cannot tell it's yeah, really you, written by you, him. And moving on from these two, I would say I would, ne I would not watch either of these again. Everything else above this, not only would I watch it again, but I think they're all great movies. We both agree that adaptation is maybe the one that has like a couple of points that prevent us from like fully embracing it but nonetheless is a very good film. It's about Nicolas Cage, who's a struggling screenwriter, playing 
a character named Charlie Kaufman who's struggling to adapt a book based on orchids. And you get the sense that the movie he was supposed to make was literally an adaptation of this book. And what he ended up making was a film about himself adapting the book. It's just so innovative. And also, the, Nicolas Cage has a twin. So there's like Charlie Kaufman and there's Donald Kaufman who doesn't exist in real life. And it's Charlie Kaufman like grappling with two different sides of himself. The Charlie Kaufman character is what you'd expect. He's like depressed, lonely, horrendously awkward. And his brother is like kind of dopey and carefree. He's able to write script ideas that Charlie thinks are stupid and dumb and generic he's selling but out. they're actually like very successful this is a movie about the making of its own screenplay you get the sense that charlie kaufman when writing this movie was just like he knows how to sell out and just get a screenplay out there but he's so obsessed with like maintaining integrity into his screenplay and so eventually what does he do he writes about the only thing that he can think about while writing the screenplay writing the screenplay itself of course this could have been like a dumb film school project where you're like, ooh, I'm very interesting, I'll put myself into it. If you criticize it for being self-indulgent, you're just like missing the point. I mean, that's the point of the movie, isn't it? And then you're not missing the point. I think this movie is really like fun to watch because you have to pay attention to like two levels. Because on one hand, you're watching the story, but then on the other hand, you can't help but to be made aware of the fact that this is about the process of its own making. The performances are fantastic all around. Like Nicolas Cage, if you think he's like a goofball, not good actor, like after this movie, you'll know that he's actually a very good actor. And Meryl Streep and Chris Cooper give excellent performances as well. The film was nominated for SAG Ensemble. Streep and Cage were nominated and Chris Cooper won a supporting actor Oscar and the movie was nominated for screenplay. It was close to getting best picture and director and it didn't. And who was nominated for screenplay? Charlie Kaufman and... And Donald Kaufman. And yeah, Charlie Kaufman literally got two Oscar nominations. No, he didn't movie. actually get two nominations. But, but if you look on IMDb, it shows two. He got the credit on the nomination for it being written by himself twice. It's and, this really interesting commentary on screenwriting in general, yeah. which is that the screenplay needs to cater to what the audience wants to get. Like we want to glean some kind of meaning from it. So if he's struggling with, oh, life is meaningless, like there are no real endings, then we wouldn't actually enjoy the film. And in the end, the film we get, because he chooses to embrace the tropes, is a better film. It's a really fascinating film and, if, and it's a must watch just because of how unique it is, if nothing else. This is one of three films that he's done that was like the number six slot seemingly to oh, be yeah. the best picture. And, and we, will never get, we will get into him. that. It's never happened and it probably never will. Next on the list is Being John Malkovich, Charlie Kaufman's first film that put him square kaputs on the map. People were just like yeah. so excited about the prospect of what is the screamer going to do next because being John Malkovich is one of the most original creative films ever that works in the most bizarre way. It shouldn't be like a touching, emotionally resonant film. And somehow it manages to be exactly that. It treats the character's desires like really seriously. The desire to be somebody else, the exhilaration of being in another body. I also think Spike Jones like totally nailed the sort of dark comedy. I like how John Cusack in the movie when he tells people like, there's a portal in the office that goes into John Malkovich's head and Catherine Keener's just like, that's weird. She doesn't say like, no, there's not. That doesn't make sense. There's a lot of ways in which some elements of the story like don't make any sense and are very far removed from reality to the point where it's like science fiction. Um, even the way that the characters behave sometimes, like Spike Jones made it make sense instead of making it feel like ridiculous. I think in a way this film could have been a human nature if it was in the wrong hands. And kudos to Spike Jones. He really nailed adaptation and being John Malkovich. The characters in the film are just very despicable as well. And I was like wondering why I cared about them getting what they wanted. And so it's just strangely compelling. Like he wants to have sex with this girl that he met at work so bad that he's willing to like be a complete monster to his wife. The conclusion of the film, like the character's fate, is just so morbid and darkly comic and sad. It was just the perfect ending. It's also just like such a surprising movie where at every turn it's just like doing something new and exciting, exploring new possibilities within its own world. The film was a fucking roller coaster too. It is just a superb screenwriting feat, I think. This was nominated for three Oscars, 
director. It got director, screenplay, and supporting actress for Catherine Keener. Cameron Diaz actually came pretty close. This close to Missing Picture. Just Missed Picture. It got yeah. PGA, DGA, SAG Ensemble. It's just insane how this was not nominated for Best Picture. Next on the list is Anomalisa. This is his most recent film, aside from the new one, and it's his only animated film. Like many of his films, it is fucking bizarre. It's so interesting as an animated movie because... What animated movie do they not, like, go on an adventure? Like, they're in a hotel. Yeah. The most dull and drab things go on, and yet it's, like, a gorgeously animated stop-motion film. In Anomalisa, we're basically in the mindset of this character, Michael, who perceives everyone around him to have the same face and the same voice, the voice of Tom Noonan, even little children, women, everybody is Tom Noonan. But then he encounters a woman who he perceives to be unique and different and have a different voice and base and he becomes obsessed with her and after seeing it key new york i think it's pretty amazing that he decided to do something so contained actually my first time watching this film i was almost a little underwhelmed i also didn't quite understand the film but i was like wow like not a lot happened compared to his last film which i love so much but on repeat viewings like i just get more and more out of this story i pick up on more symbolism and it gets like sadder every time. Like the end is really tragic. The movie is suggesting that we all to an extent like may have this sort of disease where we perceive ourselves as being like the most unique person out there. I think both of his directed films become even sadder and more melancholy. This is very consistent with like the tone of Sinatra Hugh New York. You have this character who is completely limited by their inability to see outside of their own perception and like recognize who other people are. It's almost like nightmarish when you really think about it, even though the, the film is sort of a comedy. Being in this guy's brain for an hour and a half is a very hellish scenario. He's like absolutely alone. He either sees them as like being amazing and being, you know, the thing that fulfills all of his desires or they literally offer him nothing. Like there's nothing he can gain from them. The first time I saw it, I agree. I wasn't sure what to make of it. And it actually sunk in over like the next week to the point where I was like, this is a really great film. No matter why, when I watched it again, that was confirmed for me. I remember this film sat with me for a while and it made me feel like pretty sad in, in general when I thought about it. It was just a very depressing idea. His newest film seemed very much to be about like disappointment, like the recognition that as people, like, we all have these kind of insane expectations for other people and that also, nobody can fulfill. And in a way, like, everybody is a narcissist. Just, like, that's kind of human nature because you can only experience yourself. At the core of it, like, this character, Michael, is actually deeply afraid of being this fraud where he's not special. And also just the way that this entire thing is animated sort of makes you aware that this entire world is constructed. We're in somebody's head. And I actually think that a lot of people who might miss the point of the film, you have to realize that you are entirely in the character's head the whole movie, except for the last shot. It's also really funny. It's also extremely cringy, but in like the best way. Like so much of the film is like hilarious because of how like oh like I hate what I'm seeing right now I, I hate this freaking guy and like the, his level of creepiness is just insane yeah all of his characters are so goddamn cringy too like oh yeah. my god and it also weirdly enough has like one of the most realistic raw sex scenes full of puppet penis that you don't want to miss and next on the list just getting better here folks somehow eternal sunshine of the spotless mind is I think Maybe his most seen film, maybe his most accessible film. It's the relationship film. It's the film that seems to capture relationships in like the most realistic way. Well, and, I well, I'll, well, look, what, what, what wouldn't you? What? What? Bef the before trilogy. I'm going to stop you. Okay. Say that's Okay. Well, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. This film feels like very real and it basically shows you a relationship from the point of like complete destruction to the point where like, oh my God, this is why I fell in love with this person. This is like such a fucking perfect movie. Most of the time the film has like a levity to it. Uh, that's like very exciting. And you're like curious about where it's going to go. And it's going for all these twists and turns. 
And then it also has these moments that like really grab you. And then this film will like make you cry, you know, like several times just because it's able to like paint a portrait of a relationship with like all the good and bad like baked in. It speaks to like regret, the power of like memories, any relationship that anyone's been in. On a base level, this movie is about like why we would choose to go out onto the ice even though it's breaking. But I would say even more than that, it's about how even knowing if a relationship is going to end, we're not really the ones like choosing if we're gonna go for it or not because in an almost compulsory way, like we just chase after like what we fall in love with. And it also seems again, like to be acknowledging that there's this inevitable disappointment to relationships. It seems to be like the real commentary of the film that's kind of sad is that relationships are disappointment. And at the same time, we can't stay away from them. You know, if all of Charlie Kaufman's films are to some extent about the tragedy of being trapped inside of your own mind, being unable to experience things outside of that. You know, we have a movie where the character is for a period of time able to navigate their memories and experience them as strongly as they had happened, something that we're unable to do. If we had the ability to do it, we would view our lives differently. Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet are perfect in this film, perfectly cast, and they play characters that are probably not that similar to who they are in real life. And they're just entirely believable. They both deserve Oscar nominations, but only Kate Winslet got one. And this was Charlie Kaufman's Oscar winning script. Which makes oh, sense. Like, yeah. how do you not give it to him after this is like his third masterpiece screenplay? I also think that it may be his most visually appealing movie cinematography, editing, the directing, like Michel Gondry is just a music video director and he incorporated so many interesting visual trickery and effects that really speak to like a dream logic that I think we can all relate to. Such an inventive movie. I mean, the shot of them on the ice, like there's just iconic shit in this movie. It's kind of like an effortlessly shot movie though, in a way, because it doesn't feel like all the shots are meticulously planned out, even though I know there's a lot that goes into them. It has it has like a very organic feel to it. Nobody has stared relationships in the face as nakedly as he does in this film. And the final film, if you haven't been able to deduce it already, Synecdoche, New York. One of my favorite films since I saw it for the second time many, many years ago. And as a, I think I was a high schooler, I connected with like the films just kind of sadness like that monologue of the guy at the funeral i think is something that at like a younger age you can just appreciate because you know everything is fucked up and fuck other people kind of mindset life is a slog and it's disappointing you're gonna go through it you're gonna try to grab on to all of these moving parts while like really missing everything because it, your life is just flying past you in the end, like, you're just gonna die. You're just gonna die. I mean, that's probably more of the part where, like, as a teenager, I liked that it was like, yeah, you're just gonna die, and it's just being honest with you about that. Because when you discover that you're gonna die, and you're like, wait, we're gonna die. Like, why are we even do anything? Why, are, why do we act, like, this way versus that way if we're all just gonna die? And then I think you grow out of that because you can't just live thinking that, so you have to come up with some, something else. But watching it now, I don't think it's as much of a cynical movie as it initially appears to be like, yeah, it's one of the most depressing movies I've ever seen. At the same time, there's so many places in the film where it's critical of the protagonist for not having done something that they actually could have done. There are many choices and, and threads in the film where this character could have turned his life into something better. And he never does until I think one moment towards the end. And then he realizes like, my God, I've been, I haven't been living my entire life. And at the same time, he's still sort of like the sad sack who is trapped. In the second half of the movie, it's really about someone who has been so disappointed with life that the only thing that they can think to do is to reconstruct their life in this play. They win, the character wins a MacArthur grant and is therefore able to do like, you know, whatever they want with infinite money. And they spend like the rest of their life creating this play that they think will provide clarity for like the meaning of what it all was. But the character spends so much time attempting to deconstruct their life that it becomes this infinitely impossible task. It's almost a dangerous but like very alluring part of the creative process for many writers. If one does try to find meaning in their own lives, like through their writing, they can rabbit hole into their brains and stop kind of living 
on the outside. Everything is kind of amounting to, you know, what am I going to make of all this stuff that's happening? And it amounts to like not really being present with anybody around you. Everybody's kind of a projection of his. I'll bring it back to when I was a teenager. Again, I was pretty concerned with trying to find like the right meaning to my life. I think you infinitely grasp at that. I think it's always changing throughout your life. He keeps coming up with different titles for what he's going to call his play because he can't he can't pin it down. This protagonist is completely stunted in his ability to actually grow as a human being and he misses out on what life's really about. He misses out on like joy and happiness and fulfillment. And he thinks he's this special person who he's the only one who fully gets that life just sucks and it's shitty. But everyone around him their lives suck and they're shitty. It's like pretentious of him to even assume that about other people. And I think that's something we can recognize in ourselves. Like watching this film can be a very hard look in the mirror for some of us at how we're living our lives or how we're neglecting others around us. Every time I watch it, it gets better. Things I don't pick up on in individual scenes. There's scenes that resonate even more. Like Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance just grows. It's like my favorite performance of his. His directing of the performances is magnificent. Kind of like Anomalisa, we are in the mindset of a character who is so self-obsessed. There's even a character who literally just exists to follow this character around. And every time I watch this movie, I realize how many shots Tom Noonan is actually in in the first half of the film. It speaks to this weird feeling that Charlie Kaufman is, I think, saying that we all have where we think that like, somebody is spectating us. There's a fear that everything we're doing is just going to disappear once we're gone. Like we want to be seen. We want others to like know our experience because it's all we have. It's a really, know, really yeah. sad, emotional film. Yeah, just sit just sit with the credits and like listen to the lyrics of Little Person. And, and do the same in Anomalisa. Sit there and just f feel that like sadness and let it wash over you. That's, that's how you yeah, experience yeah, this film. Exactly. This film received very like mixed reviews when it came out. It seems like every year it goes on, there are more and more people who are jumping on the Synecdoche, New York is a masterpiece train. <laughs> Roger Ebert called it the best movie of that decade. I think you won't get the most out of any of his great films if at the end you can't see how you're staring into a mirror of yourself. He's almost like putting himself on the line for all of us to see what we're all like on the inside. He's really like bearing all of the ugliest parts of who we are, how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us. We just really have to thank him for doing this for all of us. I have my expectations very high for I'm thinking of anything. things. I'm planning on watching it more than once, not even entirely expecting to get it on the first viewing. So gotta make sure that before I go into filming the review or an analysis, which we also really wanna do, we wanna do a separate analysis, I wanna make sure that I understand why it's a masterpiece and that I'm not dismissing anything that he has to say. I, I'm just incredibly hyped for it. Better like it or I'm gonna be pretty upset at myself. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. What's your favorite Charlie Kaufman movie?